pleasure to welcome you to this worship service by Aldersgate United Methodist Church, where our vision statement is to grow in love, seek justice for all creation. I am Stephanie McKean, and I encourage you to check out our website at graldersgate.org. Aldersgate is a community where all are welcome to participate fully in the life of the congregation. Regardless of age, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, special needs, economic or marital status, or faith history. Our core values are faith, grace, justice, love, and prayer. Values are the root of our beliefs and our behaviors. By becoming more aware of these important factors, we can use them as a guide to make the best choice in any situation. We conclude our three-part series today on grace. We have talked about prevenient or preventing grace and accepting or justifying grace. Today our focus is on sustaining or sanctifying grace. It is about John Wesley's notion of sanctifying grace, God at work in us as we work out our salvation and move ever onward toward perfection in the love of Christ. Let us begin worship by lighting the Christ candle. As you prepare yourselves for worship, we encourage you to light a candle as a reminder that the Lord is present. Uniting us together, no matter how far apart we are, an ever-present light in our darkness. So today, Grayson McKean is going to be lighting our candle. And now, let us be in the spirit of prayer by preparing ourselves for worship quieting our inner selves from all that is on our minds and in our hearts, so that way you may hear his word. Take a deep breath, breathing in the Holy Spirit. Receive his peace. Let his peace fill you and renew you and give you comfort and strength. Amen. Savior, be 
special hello to our children this morning. As we are finishing our series on grace, we wanted to um, talk about a group of people who have a lot of grace for us, and those are our teachers, specifically our Sunday school teachers here at Aldersgate. And we want to say thank you for all that you have done for us throughout the year. And here are some words from some of our own. Thank you. Thank you, Sunday School teachers, Miss Judy, Miss Kat, Miss Jan, Miss Linda, Miss Sandy. Thank you. Thank you, Sunday School teachers, Miss Ann, Pastor Owen. Thank you for teaching me so much. Thank you. Thank you to Rick Wiltsey and Laura Wachowski for facilitating the adult hot topics class this year and to Dave Wiltsey and Ellen Brubaker for co-leading the short-term adult class. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Ann and Miss Ellen for teaching me in Sunday school. And thank you, Mr. Rick and Miss Laura for teaching me music. It's really fun to do. Bye. Hi, my name is Tayson, and I would like to say thank you to all of my Sunday school teachers. And I hope you see, and I hope I see you soon. <coughs> Can you say thank you? Thank you. Who are you saying thank you to? Miss Megan. Miss Megan. Thank you, Miss Megan. Thank you, Sunday School Teachers. breaking new ground. 
ground You are breaking new ground So make me a vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be Cause where there is no wine, there is no power, there is no freedom, and the kingdom is here. I lay down my old flames to carry your new fire today. So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Okay, we've explored God's prevenient and justifying grace and how they are manifest in our own lives. God cares for us even before we know it, and God is always ready to accept us when we return home to the kingdom of love. But where does this get any of us? Is this a constant struggle of failure and repentance? Of spiritual falling and rising? Do we ever, I don't know, arrive? Well, yes and no. Well, how does that help us when there is so much uncertainty, loss, disconnection, and inconvenience? John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, set up bands and classes, meeting groups, so that people could stay in touch and lift one another up in faith. Out of such fellowship came peace, mutuality, vision, a heart for the mission, a strong faith, and, go figure, questions, questions, questions. One of the wonderments of the early followers of Methodism was, if I may paraphrase, so Father John, how does the grace of God actually work? Wesley had a threefold answer. We've delved into God's prevenient and justifying grace. Today, with assistance from the author of the letter to the followers, of the way of Jesus in Rome, we'll take a look at sanctifying grace. The evangelist writes, But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah, I see you as well. 
support for the ministries of Aldersgate. Such generosity empowers us to be the church in familiar and in new ways. Remember, you can contribute online at our website, graldersgate.com, or mail your gift to Aldersgate United Methodist Church, 4301 Ambrose Avenue, Northeast, Grand Rapids, 49525. Today we complete a series on Wesley's concepts of God's grace. We've looked at pervenient grace, the grace that keeps us always connected to God, that allows us never to be separated from God. We've looked at justifying grace, the grace that accepts us as a child of God, where and who we are. And today we look at sanctifying grace, the grace that perfects us in love. And reflecting on sanctifying grace, the gift of the Spirit, this week, I came across the words of Paul, who reminds us that we all fall short, and we are all given the grace to be the living Christ for others. Let's pray. 
Gracious God, thank you for your grace that has gone before me and your promise that I am never separated from you. Thank you for your grace that despite my faults and failures has accepted me as a child in your kingdom. And thank you for the grace that calls me out beyond comfort and preference to share your love with others. Come to us now, God of Pentecost and mighty winds and tongues of fire. Come to us that we may hear your word. Amen. So it's not just Sanctifying Grace Sunday, it's also Pentecost Sunday. You remember the story of Pentecost? Do you recall the story? The darkened room, disciples hiding out, shades drawn, shutters shut for fear of being found out as followers of the way of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus. Even in the midday, the room would be more dark than light. Maybe a single candle lighting the room, but nothing to call attention to themselves, nothing at all keeping a low profile, and then, with a gust of wind, the Spirit breaks in. Oh my, 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 is it hot in here, or is it just me? What the, where did you come from? Well, that's a smoking question there, Revner. I come from the same place you do. You're my long lost brother? Wow. And no. Not very bright, this one. A few watts short of a light bulb. Well then, who or what are you? I am the frenetic to your schizo. I am the code to your psych. I am the it to your id. I am the jealous to your Ivan. What? I'm you on fire with the Holy Spirit. Duh. Now have a sip of ice water and let's do this. Okay, thanks. But our styles, uh, well, they really don't. They don't what? Well, it just seems to be like, you know, um, fire and water. Listen, you do you, and I'll do me, and we let God do the rest. What do you say? Well, okay, I guess. Well, get to getting. Call down fire from heaven, prophet. We're burning daylight here. So obviously I'm compelled to adjust my initial purpose and posture for this sermon. I mean, Pentecost has kind of interrupted it. So instead of wondering out loud if anyone could ever achieve spiritual perfection, maybe it would be best to look at what spiritual perfection looks like from the lens of Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost was the gift of the Spirit of God upon the disciples of Jesus, a mighty wind and tongues of fire. The realization that the living Christ is in everyday life and in life's exceptional experiences in all things. It's the miracle we get stuck on the seemingly drunk and disorderly mumblings of Jesus' followers witnessing to their faith. And we know because the story tells us they weren't drunk at all, and they weren't mumbling. They were speaking different languages. There it is. That's the miracle, right? Well, traditionally, yes. But I'm not so sure. Uh-oh, where are you going with this, prophet? You're not heading to the Hotel Heresy, are you? It's got an ungodly reputation. Well, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Nice musical pun there. Thanks. 
the spirit raises me up like eagle's wings. <laughs> How about a guitar solo? No thanks. Anyway, why would they be speaking different languages and why would that be considered a miracle? When language is the most basic of human creations, gestures, sounds, words, phrases, expressions. It's how humans, well, it's how we be human. The fact that the disciples were speaking several different languages should come as no surprise to us. We in the good old US of A, most of us, we don't speak more than two languages if we speak that many. English has long been relegated as the muttering of the masses. The disciples, however, that's a different story. Remember who they were? Remember where they came from? Fishermen living and working around Lake Galilee. Hard work, yes. Hand-to-mouth existence, probably. Ignorant, not if you want to survive. The lake community was cosmopolitan. Just as lake communities or any community near a body of water today, people come from all over, and they did then too. And they spoke different dialects and even different languages. So if you're a business person operating near a lakeshore community from then and even now, chances are you'd better familiarize yourself with the lingo, you know? The language of the people who reside and visit there, the language of your customers, as it were. The same is true if you're a zealot, a violent and vegetable anti-Roman government activist. You had better speak fluently the language and lingo of your enemy to better infiltrate their system and to better protect yourself. If you're a physician, like Luke was purported to be, your studies would require you to know several languages to better, well, to better educate yourself on the study of traditional health care and practice. Even if you're a shepherd, you better have at least a working vocabulary in other languages to sell your stock to temple priests and to visiting foreigners. Personally, I'm not so sure the speaking of several languages is the spiritual miracle it's made out to be. Oh, looky, looky, look, looky, look, 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 looky, looky, look. What? I've been slain by the spirit. Oh my, oh yes, ouch, ooey, uh, bazinga. Really? Well, I believe the technical terminology is slain in the spirit. And it's usually not done with a bass violin accessory. That was a low bow. I thank you very much. Let up, brother, I'm on fire. Can you feel the burn? I'm aching to learn. Can you feel the scorch? I'm a truth torch. Can you feel the flame? I'm singing out God's name. Can you feel the heat? Let's take it to the street in my Jesus sandals. Oh yeah. No, no, you keep right on going, prophet. I just thought we needed, you know, a little pizzazz. What is miraculous is that the disciples stepped up and out not just out of the dark building into the light of day where they might be recognized as members of the latest protest group to be demonized and tortured. No, they stepped out of their comfort zone. Fishing, tax collecting, doctoring, violence and retaliation to invite others, all others, to join them in proclaiming God's love in Christ Jesus. So what can we, what can you learn from this, our modern, post-scientific, post-enlightenment, pandemic existence. What are some ways that, that you can step out while you continue to stay in? 
How can you better up your sharing of God's love with the people around you, your family, your neighbors, your community? The miracle is, whether you are on fire or living day to day, the Spirit is with and within you, seeking to lead you into well-worn and into new ways of sharing God's love, to be the light of the world in Christ's name. So according to Wesley, God's grace has covered each and every one of us, even and especially the ones we don't like very much, ones we've never met, and the ones we have met and would just as soon forget. God's grace has covered all of us, all at once and in every single moment. God's provenient grace keeps us always and ever in the presence of God. We are never separated from God's love. God's justifying grace accepts us, faults and all, as a child of God, redeemed by Christ to do what God created us to do to help redeem the world. God's sanctifying grace holds us up and beckons us ever onward into new and deeper ways of being the Christ for others, perfecting us in love. That's God at work making us holy. Hey, prophet! Can you tell me how to make holy water? Wait, what? Now you're heckling me? <laughs> we all have our crosses to bear. Be in the moment with the spirit, man. How do you make holy water? I don't know. You boil the hell out of it. Oh, for Christ's sake. Exactly. Just a little liturgical levity, you know, to keep people interested. Did the disciples have to deal with this kind of thing on Pentecost? You have no idea. Simply put, friends, sanctifying grace is mindfully living Wesley's famous covenant prayer. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you, or set aside for you, praised for you, or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. And the way that we best live out that covenant is by implementing one of John Wesley's better-known life philosophies. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, with all the people you can, as long as ever you can. We do that, and with God's grace, we will experience spiritual perfection. Stay safe, be well. Let the Spirit set your faith on fire. Are you speaking figuratively or literally? Yeah, fire up, fire up, fire up your faith. Mm. Fire up, fire up, fire up your faith. You done now? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that was so hot. Okay, so, um, friends, may God continue to bless you as you live out your faith in love. And on fire! Seriously? Searingly, seriously, sizzingly, seriously, scorchingly, scaldingly, overly, seasonedly, seriously! God's peace be yours. And fire! Heat it up, heat it up! Heat up your faith, double up, double up, heat it up, heat it up, heat up your faith, fire! 
Okay, that's enough. We're done. Rare, medium, and well done with fire. Spark up the Barbie world. Here comes the love of God. Let's get ready to pray. The following prayer request is from Lori Elliott. Prayers for the passing of Lori Elliott's father, David, that he is at peace as the family holds close to their hearts the wonderful memories they will cherish, and that they continue to work toward healing. We also want to remember to pray for those of our family who are homebound, our congregational family members like Mary Lou Arnold, Joanne Ensley, Eleanor Howison, Lois Jessup, Barb Libby, and Arlene Parker. And I've been notified that our child care center the Aldersgate Center for Child Development is in need of some supplies, particularly uh, disinfecting wipes. So if you have some that you can spare and would like to donate to the center, you can call the center or perhaps the church office to make sure that that donation can be received safely. Thank you. Let's pray. Pentecost God, fire of love already within us, what a privilege it is to be called a child of yours and to have been redeemed from darkness into the light of Christ. Simply because of your amazing grace poured out on us all in abundance. With all our hearts, we thank you, God. We are not worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table, and yet you have clothed us in Christ's righteousness. Thank you for your amazing grace and the heavenly calling you have placed upon our lives. Help us to continue to work out our salvation and to step out in faith when we see an opportunity to share your love. As disciples ourselves, ambassadors of heaven, we pray that we may reflect Christ's beauty and grace to others. We pray Christ may be seen in us so that others may be drawn to you. And we pray that we may increase in our faith and in the sight of others, so that Christ may increase in every area of our lives. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well said, prophet. Well said. Well, thank you, spirit within me. Thanks a lot. I have a question. What is it? What do you do? when the fire starts to fade? An excellent question, and apparently very timely. We'll be talking about that in our next series, so stick around. Thanks, I will. You know I'm with you all the time, to one degree or another, right? Yes, I know, and I am grateful. I hope to join us next week. By grace we have been saved through faith and not by keeping law. But saints believed by what they heard and not by what they saw. And not by what they saw. For all have sinned and fallen short, God's plan not one obeyed. Christ has for all fulfilled the law. Believe, confess, be saved. Believe, confess, be saved. We know the wage of sin is death. Thank God we shall revive. For just as Jesus rose again, we too are made alive. We too are made alive. Set free, we now have peace with God. Salvation is secured. How beautiful the feet of those who share the gospel word, who share the gospel word. Grace is on our lips and in our hearts this morning. God, great, your grace is in our hands. We take it with us, spreading thankfulness wherever we go. Amen.